So what do you think the main factors that can cause cleft lip or cleft palate are? Uh, cleft lip and cleft palate is uh, known to be a multifactorial inheritance pattern, uh, meaning that there is not one specific factor that causes it. Um, there have been multiple things that have been shown to, to increase the risk of it, such as smoking, um, uh, a family history of having cleft lip or palate, They've done studies that show living at higher altitudes cause it, certain medications increase it. But basically, there's not one sole reason why children get cleft lip and palate. It's what we call multifactorial. There are some syndromes which are associated with it. A syndrome is something that is genetically found to consistently produce a, a, a cleft lip or a cleft palate or other anomalies. Um, but those are pretty rare. Uh, and not nearly as common as just an isolated... How do the treatments of cleft differ from a developed country like the United States versus a developing country? Well, in, in, in the United States, every child gets care for their, for their clefting. And so there's definitely better access to care. I think they get more frequent care in terms of whether they need revisions or other surgeries. Um, also, there's the whole gamut of cleft care. It's not just the surgeries, but a lot of times it's whether they need orthodontics and there's better access to care for orthodontics in our country. There's better access to speech therapy in our country for kids who have cleft in the palate they frequently have speech issues. Um, there's better care for things like um, from ear, nose, and throat doctors in terms of getting their tonsils taken care of, getting ear tubes if they need it, having hearing tests. And so in the, in the United States, most kids get a very comprehensive care plan developed for them. Whereas in, in developing countries, um, a lot of the care is dependent upon either mission work, where a, a group goes and operates on children, or if, um, if a family is well-to-do, then they can afford to go to one of the centers that may be in their country and afford those things. But if you're um, uh, at a lower socioeconomic standpoint, it's not guaranteed that you're going to even get the basics of care, the basic surgeries for these, let alone the more multidisciplinary, comprehensive care that's offered. And do you feel that organizations States? should go to developing countries with their own doctors? Or do you think they should go over to teach the country's doctors how to properly treat cleft? Both. Um, and I think most of the organizations try to do that, um, like uh, Smile, Smile Train, there's another one called Interplast, um, uh, that they try to do that um, and I think that's good. It still comes down to somewhat of a socioeconomic question. I think that um, you can have well-trained physicians in the primary country, but a lot of the physicians in, in the developing countries have a much more uh, business aspect look at this, where you think about it being pay to play, essentially. Yeah. And, if, and if families can't afford the services, because it's not just the surgeon's fee, but maybe the family can't afford the anesthesiologist's fee, or other things like that that are associated, or the, whatever the hospital charges them to go to the hospital and have the operation. So um, I think it's good that people go down with the doctors, because in general they bring resources as well, which allow them to offset some of those fees. I think they need to train doctors in those countries so that if they want to do pro bono work, they know how to do it correctly and stuff like that, or they want to develop those skills and, and do whatever they want to do. So I think it has to be a combination of both, where the resources need to come into the country, but also they should be teaching people so that there is the, you know, the, the hope that that eventually this can, this, the kids can get proper care. Um, do you think organizations should also focus on later treatments, like speech therapy, like what you talked about earlier? Um, I think uh, that's a very challenging thing to do. Um, I think that they should focus on like the, the gum line repair more than they do. Um, kids, have, kids with cleft lip and cleft palate also have a cleft of their gum line, you know, mm -hmm. when the dental structures come in, and that's frequently not fixed. Usually the kids get the lip repair or they get the palate repair, and that's mostly it, but they don't always get that gum line repair. But for a lot of things like orthodontics and speech, I mean, those are things that you have to have um, a lot of infrastructure for, meaning you can't have a speech therapist come and meet with a kid once 
and say, hey, go do this, and I'll be back next year. A yeah. lot of kids need 20 minutes every week or something like that, and, and I don't know that they have that infrastructure. And the same is true with, like, orthodontics and things of that nature. I mean, you go to an orthodontics, you have to have the wires twisted or tuned every every week or not every, every month or so. And so I don't know that they have the that ability for that type of care. A lot of these patients will come, I mean, uh, some of the patients will come, you know, walk for hours, you know, they might come down from the mountains or wherever they, they are, and this might be the only time they ever see a doctor because they hear about their chance to have their cleft lip repaired. They, uh, it's not they don't care about the other things, it's just they just want to look more socially acceptable. Yeah. And that's what's fine with them. Um, and they wouldn't have the ways or means to necessarily come to the city or wherever the, the small city you're, you're working at and every week, every month to ha even get those basic services anyways. Do you know what the social kind of consequences are for the people that do have untreated cleft? Like how does the society treat them? A lot of times it's very, um, it's very much a social um, mark, shall we say, and a lot of them uh, have difficulty marrying, they have difficulty um, with, um, you know, finding higher paying jobs and stuff like that. It definitely sets them up to be in the lower socioeconomic classes of their society and not not have the ability to progress as if, if they didn't have that congenital deformity, you know. Yeah. They were already at, a, a lot of them were already at a disadvantage because they started in a lower socioeconomic status yeah. and it just doesn't let them rise if they had the ability as much. Which do you think is more effective? Do you think Operation Smiles technique is more effective? Or do you think Smile Train is more effective? Because Smile Train focuses on teaching more mm -hmm. than Operation. I have I've only I've done an Operation Smile mission. I haven't done a Smile Train mission. Um, I think um, I mean Op Smile was the first one that kind of started, and they do some teaching. Like the one I went I went to Brazil, and there was a Brazilian doctor, and there was an Argentinian doctor. Um, on that trip, I think the 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 um, the idea of teaching is probably more important because you have to hold out the hope that eventually you can train enough of them that they'll be able to serve their population better. And you know, you shouldn't see a kid that's twelve year old that has a cleft lip that's unrepaired. I mean, that's yeah. just philosophically not easy to take. Um, and so you you hope that by teaching more of them, that some of them will get the bug and and do it, you know, right. whether it be pro bono like I talked about or whatever, just start getting some of those patients cared for. Right. Recently, I found this article, it was released February 14th, so it's very recent, that Operation Smile and Smile Chain announced that they're going to actually combine. Oh, okay. good. Yeah, so which one, like, which technique do you think they should adopt? Or maybe, like, if they should just kind of mix the two? Like, what do you think they should do? Um, I think that the <laughs> The best part of them combining is that it better utilizes their resources to do good. I don't know the answer whether one does something better, because I'm sure if you peop go to people who've done a ton of op smile missions, they'll say, oh, this is the best. You go to t people that do smile training, they'll say, we're better because we do this thing or that thing better. What I think is what's really the best part of the merger is resource utilization. There's less competition for getting dollars from the limited donor pool and then and, and you think about you know you're having only one company do advertising versus two companies doing yeah. advertising which means if they you know if if they had to spend you know ten thousand dollars in advertising that's ten thousand dollars more that can go to the care of, of children um, and so I think that's that's the real advantage is that everyone Everyone in these organizations wants to do good, and they want to help, and they, they're called to it because they care. And, and so decreasing the, what's the functional overhead of them, I think that's the real advantage of them. You know, I think um, this is one of those things where having, you know, not to sound like a politician, but bipartisanship and all those things, it, it, actually, it actually will get better care because of the fact that you're going to have more resources funneling into the country and not being, you know, in terms of, you think about, you know, letterhead and all these little things that make a big difference. Yeah. You know, videos and stuff, that those all cost money to produce. 
and and whether I, one says they have a lower operating function, a lower operating overhead than the other, combining them is just going to make that better. So more f more money is going to flow in for the kids. Right. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Uh, no. I think that's good, actually. Okay. Yeah. Well.